specific information and the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with the right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the City of Medford website at www.medfordma.org. For this meeting, members of the public, public who wish to listen or watch the meeting may do so by accessing the meeting link contained herein. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technology, technology means. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the City of Medford or Medford Community Media, Media website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive rec record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. The meeting can be viewed through Medford Community Media on Comcast Channel 22 and Verizon Channel 43 at 4 p.m. Since the meeting will be held remotely, participants can log or, log or call in by using the following link or call-in number. Um, Medford School Committee on Zoom, um, telephone information, 1929-205-6099. Uh, Additionally, questions or comments can be submitted during the meeting by emailing medfordsc at medford.k12.ma.us. Those submitting must include the following information, your first and last name, your Medford street address, and your question or comment. There will be a Committee of the Whole meeting on Monday, April 6th from 4 to 5.30 p.m. by Zoom. The purpose of this meeting is to discuss the budgets for the following departments, art, physical education, library media, health services, and athletics. I'm signed by Dr. Maurice Edouard Vincent, superintendent of the Medford Public Schools. So welcome, we have 22 participants on. It looks like um, the school committee, if we could take the role, Madam Secretary. Certainly. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so member Jenny Graham. Here. Member Kathy Kretz. Here. Member um, Melanie McLaughlin. Present. Member Mia Mastone. Right here. Member Paul Rousseau. Present. Member Paul, Paulette Vanderkloot. Present. And Mayor Luongo Kern. Present. Seven present, zero absent. We have a full committee. I know we are going to start with Art. I'm not sure if Ms. Patterson has any comments initially. So if you'd like, um, just for ease of transition, I can share my screen again and we can go That's through great. the departments. Okay, great. So um, Tony, you'll be up first. All right. Ready. And we are going to make sure that we have, show all my windows here. So uh, going with the same format that we have been utilizing for our previous uh, budget meetings, we are identifying the proposed column, which you can see. Can you see the screen here? Yes. Okay. So for fiscal year 2021, this is the proposed column that the department heads have identified their need for the upcoming fiscal year. In the narrative documents that they had shared, they have identified the specifics that go that make up each of their line items, and they have identified any of um, their their hopeful items um, if there were um, such an opportunity. So for the fine arts department, um, again, I'm just utilizing a placeholder line item for the total of the departmental value of the steps and lane colas going into fiscal year 2021 for the department it is one million eight hundred twenty eight thousand eight hundred and twenty nine dollars for the salaries and as we go through each of the individual uh, fine art um, supply and or instruction contract service textbook amounts uh, Mr. Zignij will um, explain and, and go through each of his departmental 
requests, but he has a level funded budget request here for the dollar figures. So if you would like me to transition to the narrative, I'm happy to do so, or we can stay on this document and have the department heads just speak to their narrative. Can I ask a question, just protocol, um, Chair? Yes, you may. Thank Member you. McLaughlin. Thank you. So I just wanted to ask, are we doing the raise hand option on our screen? Are we raising our hand? How do you want us to to ask questions on is the first. And then the second is um, for the shared drive, um, Superintendent Vincent, I'm seeing the narrative on the shared drive, but I'm not seeing the um, budget build for this particular item unless I'm missing it. Is it a, is a, it's, a, a it's a full document, it's a PDF and it's entitled fiscal FY21 all budget build. Yes. And so what page is this on for that? I know you're sharing the screen, but I just wanna it's no. page 20 of 28. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Member Kretz. Oh, hold on. Let me unmute you. Yeah. You got it, Kathy? Oh, um, yes, I, I couldn't find these budget sheets either. Um, I'm, I still can't find them. I don't know where they are. I have the shared documents with all the narratives, but I don't have the budget sheets for these committee meetings for the committee of the whole this, this particular meeting. They are inclusive in the shared drive. So again, if, if it uh, makes it easier, I can stay on this particular page and we can go through each of the departments that we are reviewing and you can follow along as the department heads just um, review their narrative. Okay. And um, Member McLaughlin, you asked about raising hands. That's fine if you just want to raise your hand. The only thing is while we're sharing the screen, I cannot see everybody. So feel free to respectfully ask questions as you may. Um, I can only see like six people on the side and be able to see the screen. So go ahead, Ms. Patterson. Thank you. Okay. So I think um, we can turn it on to um, Tony Zignage, the uh, department head for the fine arts, and he can review his uh, narrative, identifying each of the um, categories that you see on your screen. Okay. okay. Do you have anything to add, Miss? Um. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Go ahead. Okay, not quite sure if my, if my connection was good. Um, okay, so uh, you all have the narrative. Would you like me to go through the narrative or just add, add to that? I'd like to say in the interest of time and based on the total number of departments that are going to be presenting, I would like to um, suggest that you would summarize the key points from your narrative and then refer to this document so that we're able to hear from all of the departments sure. um, today. Thank you. Sure. Absolutely. So the Okay, so the first thing I'd like to do is publicly acknowledge just our fine art staff for their phenomenal work this year. Um, it's been a trying year, and I was really pleased that they've all stepped up and volunteered to help at every turn, including right now collaborating with each other for the, um, for the um, distance learning. Um, one thing that's not mentioned in the narrative that I think was um, especially important is that mentored fi uh, five student teachers from Gordon College, Leslie University, and the School of Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts, which, um, which, is, which we need good new teachers and uh, the requirements for the, the cooperating teacher is much greater these days. So um, I think they should be commended for that. Um, so for our budget um, concerns, um, right up at the wish list is up now. Um, the maintenance of equipment that deals mainly with uh, piano tuning, uh, keeping the kilns in uh, operating condition for the art department, 
and some um, other extra things that I'll mention in a moment. Pupil transportation is for mainly for the marching band to go to and from competitions and their other um, other uh, engagements. Um, office supplies, basically mainly paper, is a big need. Um, there will come a day, I hope, when the um, everything can be done on tablets and whatever. But right now, uh, paper is still a big priority for us. Uh, the Textbook supplies is mainly, it says textbooks, but it's mainly curriculum supplies, mainly for the music teachers. Um, that includes uh, method books, printed materials, printed music, and, a, um, and some um, online uh, materials. The instructional supplies is mainly the um, consumable um, things that the art department uses. They go through a lot of paints and paper and, and, and supplies such as that. Um, hardware, uh, we have, um, again, we have the kilns in particular, and a lot of the instruments need upkeep and repair. And um, as far as the, um, in addition to our normal operating requirements, we're able to accomplish some important things, extra things this past year. Uh, the baby grand piano at the McGlynn Auditorium needed some major attention. In addition to um, needed to be tuned, the cover, the music stand had undergone significant damage over the years. So we were able to remedy that and put that instrument back into shape. And more importantly, um, I was able to replace about half of the art room stools at some of our elementary and middle school um, art rooms. These rooms had and still have the original stools from when the schools opened. And they tip over easily and have this formica type seat that when it falls, it chips and has sharp edges and leaves shards. So this year we're able to replace 20 at the Brooks, 20 at the McGlynn Middle School, 20 at the Columbus, and 15 at the Roberts with the metal type stool that you see in the art rooms, which are much sturdier and safer. So I'm hoping to replace uh, the rest next year. And another major concern, which I outlined in my wish list, is the need for a safe and functional means of displaying our student artwork. Uh, the display boards that we currently have at the schools are old and deteriorating, and there's virtually no way to dis display 3D art. And our art students create some amazing work that we really should be able to exhibit in the proper manner. So that's one of my priorities for the um, upcoming year. So pretty much that's it in a nutshell. So I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Any questions? Mayor? Yes, Member Graham. Um, just a quick question for you. For the marching band, do students pay um, participation fees to be part of the marching band? They... Yeah, there are fees associated, a lot of them. Most of it is covered by fundraising that the kids do. So it is, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it takes some money to run the marching band. And uh, unfortunately, not a lot of it is covered by the budget. So it's, um, there is a lot of fundraising involved, yes. And do you have a sense of um, the average amount of fundraising that happens year over year? to support the band? Yeah, I really don't have that. I couldn't tell you that off the top of my head. A lot goes, a lot has to do with um, what's happening for that year. Uh, um, unfortunately, we're hoping next year is the year that um, the band is supposed to go to Hawaii. And that depends a lot, a major lot on fundraising. I know Mrs. Rello has been in touch with the organizers and it's they're just kind of taking a wait and see attitude how what's gonna happen. So next year coming up is iffy as far as um, everything that's going to um, going to take place, and that includes all of the um, competitions and regular things that they normally do. And does the um, the band parent organization did they submit um, information to the district about their fundraising dollars this year? Is there some way to know what that amount of money is? I can have make sure you get that right away. I don't know. Again, everything that's normally done at the end of the year is kind of up, you know. Yeah. 
So, I, but I, I get would, it. <laughs> I'd be more than happy to make sure that uh, tomorrow we get that information to you. Yeah, whenever you have a chance. It's not urgent. I just, I'm just trying to sort of understand how all of the extracurriculars come together, um, which is different from, you know, between um, fine arts Absolutely. and athletics and all that good stuff. Thanks. Mayor? Sure. Yes, Member Van de Kloot. Yes, uh, Mr. Zigney, I just wanted to ask, um, I know that you, there's been some frustrations with um, working out um, uh, your student enrollment uh, in the um, music programs in particular. Um, what are you looking at for next year? And because you mentioned, you know, some frustrations this year. Yes, um, that's, so as far as, Again, um, not us, you know, this budget is great. If I can get what I got last year, I'm happy. Um, my biggest concern is in the area of um, access to the kids. Um, and right now is when um, the kids at home are doing their sign up. So we'll know in a few weeks if we've made any progress in that area. So the real um, issue for us is getting able to get our kids scheduled basically and this year I think we made some improvements and um, this year in the past I wasn't quite as pleased but this year I am satisfied that we have done everything that we can and I've had the access to the kids and we've been able to present our program as best we could and I'm hoping that maybe that will um, give us some improvement in our numbers especially we know there are issues at the high school um, that affect it's the scheduling that are being worked on and, and hopefully will be resolved. So I think we've done and everybody's doing everything they can to address that problem. And I'm hoping in a few weeks when those numbers come in, then we'll, we'll have some good news. So I'm optimistic. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Thank yep. you. Any other questions relating to the uh, fine arts budget? Hearing and seeing none, we can move on to physical education and health. Yes, so on screen we have the uh, page that identifies the, again, the placeholder amount for all of the salaries that include a step in lane for the upcoming fiscal year, which is $1,404,022. Each of the additional line items has been level funded again and we can um, review, I will uh, share the screenshot on the narrative as well, but if um, Rachel Perry would like to jump in and review her narrative items um, at this time. Sure, thank you. Hello everyone. Um, so I'll get right into it. I'm gonna go right through my line items and just explain what each is used for and then I'll talk about what I'm asking for for next year. Um, so first, we're looking at $6,000 um, for my fitness center supervision, and that is to have somebody open and close the fitness center after school. We have that on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursdays at the high school from 2.30 to 4.30, and that's for our staff, faculty, and for our students to be able to use the fitness center after school on three days a week, and that starts in September, and that ends in June. Um, the next line item is maintenance of equipment, uh, which we have $20,000 in that slot. And with that money, what we do is we have a fitness company come in to maintain the equipment two times a year to make sure everything's working okay and to replace anything that needs to be replaced or upgraded. We also have a company called Wing Speed come in to make sure our low elements course at the middle schools are also maintained. Um, the rest of that money we actually put towards upgrading some equipment in the fitness center, uh, which the fitness center is uh, about 10 years old. So we really start need to start upgrading some of that equipment. What we've done already is put some turf, uh, a strip of turf in the middle of the fitness center um, to work on functional training. We've added TRXs to the fitness center, moved some equipment around. We've gotten the flip tires, we've gotten kettlebells, new medicine balls. Um, so we really have done some upgrades. Um, this year I've also ordered a couple of bikes and some of the water rowers, uh, which haven't come in yet, but those will uh, additionally be added to the fitness center for this year. Um, and within the next few years, we need to continually start to upgrade some of that equipment that's in there as it is old or getting old. 
Uh, my next line item is uh, office supplies, $400. That's for paper, pens, pencils, things like that. Um, instructional supplies, we have $15,000, and that's for equipment for uh, my physical education and health education teachers. That could be anything from balls, bats, things like that, um, to health education where they need markers, poster board for projects and things. Uh, and that's for the elementaries, middle, and high schools. My next line is $7,000 for textbooks. And that is for curriculum supplies. That could be for Michigan model things that we need to reorder every year if needed at schools, um, things like that, CPR curriculum that may need to be ordered. And the last one would be travel conferences for $500. And that's for uh, conferences I could send a teacher to or for, or for myself. And so I'm looking for level funding for that piece. Um, for the past five years, I have been doing the budget. So um, I have been looking for two um, full-time positions. One being adaptive physical education teacher that will meet the needs of our special education students across the district. Um, and we're looking to continue to be inclusive, but we're also looking to support our students where they need support. And that could be a push-in model uh, where the teacher actually goes into a physical education class and works with the student, or it could also be a pull-out model, and that's going to depend on what the student needs are. Um, the other position I would be looking for is for a middle school health teacher, uh, and that's to meet the needs of the middle school students. Right now, we have one health teacher at the middle school that's going between two schools. Um, I would be looking for one to be at each school. We do have guidance counselors that are teaching some health right now, um, which could be an issue for them sometimes if they're dealing with a student in crisis, you know, have to stop what they're doing to go teach a class. Um, and I think it's would probably fit us better if we have a teacher that is licensed in health and in education in those classrooms doing that. Um, I, I don't know if you want me to go through that wish list. That, that's a big wish. <laughs> We're looking, um, doing some renovations in the girls' locker room, looking to put in a um, classroom, a spinning studio, and a yoga studio. Um, so I was looking to put in flat screen TVs, some projectors, and then um, spinning bikes, which is a, a really large cost there. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone has any questions. So just to be clear, I did not include two additional positions in the salary hold. Okay. So if, if we were to um, move forward with that, that would be something that we would need to add into this number just for clarity for the group. Okay. Mayor Lungo, Kern. Member McLaughlin. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your report, um, Ms. Perry, I appreciate it. You're um, so do you guys have a ballpark of what the, or can you give us some range of what those two positions would be? Um, obviously, I, I, I know they'll vary depending on experience or what happens. So have you. Each, each position um, for the full full year for the amount, on the, the mid range of a, a master's level would be roughly 60,000 per position. So another 120,000. Thank you. And, and then for the um, adapted uh, PE teacher, I know that's something that you and um, Bobby have been asking about for a while and you've had some conversation over. Um, do you find that there are many uh, students in the uh, special education community or with IEPs that require adapted PE? So we, in order to really know that number, we would have to do some testing on students, but just checking in with my teachers, they do feel that it, it is a need in Medford. Okay, thank you. And I'm assuming, is there a special license for um, teachers who do adaptive PE. I think one of the concerns that have been discussed in the past and you addressed it in your narrative, I appreciate that, was the inclusivity of it. And so that we're not creating a sub-separate gym class. We're creating uh, an inclusive gym class where uh, curriculum is adapted and modified for students as needed on an individual basis. Is there a special license or something for that for PE? 
There is an APENS license, but it's not mandatory to have. Um, teachers can actually practice adaptive phys ed with a physical education license, but it is something that I would want someone in that position to have. And Rachel, do you know if any of the surrounding districts that are comparable to Medford have a position like this? Yes, I have done some research on it. Malden has it. Somerville is looking to do it. Uh, Revere is putting it in for next year. I know Stoneham has it. Um, so more and more districts are adding it. And so right now, if a student's IEP requires some adapted phys physical education, how, do, how are we accommodating that? Do you know? Yeah, we would have to accommodate it with the teachers we have, which is getting very difficult because they're really at their limits as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Ms. Perry? Member Van der Kloot? I had a question also to Mayor Longo Kern after, okay. after Ms. Van Kloot. Member Van der Kloot, then Member Kratz. Member Van der Kloot, can you press on mute? <coughs> Sorry. That's good, um, thank you. You, you said that um, the two requests for the two additional faculty were not included in that one. Is that, um, and just remind me, because I don't remember since our last budget meeting, um, if anybody else had made um, requests for additional personnel, were they not included in the uh, baseline budget? Uh, correct. They would, there was a notation that they had requested it, but for the purpose of just developing our baseline amount, I did not include additional new staff at, that might be- In any requested. department. Correct. Okay, thank you very much. Member Kretz. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Ms. Perry, for the report. And um, I do recall from last year's budget um, that you did put in for the same two requests for the full-time um, adaptive PE and the, well, the, the middle school would be new, I think, this year. But um, I just want to, you know, express the need for the adaptive PE teachers for both special education and vocational students. Um, I've heard you know, many, many times, you know, at the beginning of the fall, straight through from parents and students that there is no time in their schedule to take gym or PE. Um, I'm happy to share um, an update from um, after, you know, the students have been out that um, I've heard from some of my son's friends who said that they're taking their PE um, online where they're going to, they record like, you know, an exercise that they have to send in and you know it's I guess it's working out really well so I just think that it's really important that um, you know if possible we can get both of these positions added so that there will be equity with the middle school and you know also equity with the vocational school and the high school and special education needs I, I just think it's a you know really important for you know for everybody um, so I'm, I'm really hoping that maybe there'll be extra money available for this um, item. It has been requested. Um, this is the second year in a row. So I just wanted to, you know, express my concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor. Yes, Member Graham. Thanks, Rachel. Um, just a quick question. When we talked about the middle school health curriculum, we noted um, the need for a staff person, but we also um, had some notes about um, professional development and materials. Is that included in these numbers that we're looking at on screen or are those additional costs too? Yes, that could actually come right out of that uh, textbooks line, the $7,000. Okay. Which I had already you know, had in mind for that. And what about the professional development, that too? Yes. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions relating to the physical education and health budget? Hearing and seeing none, we can go to number three. Li Thank you, Ms. Perry. Um, Thank you. Library and media, page 22 of 28. Yes, correct. So again, we have a placeholder for the salaries, uh, which includes step and lane, no additional changes, even though they might have been uh, requested in a narrative. These are just as the positions are currently um, at 1.1. Five six three eighty seven for the salaries in the media tech department, and again, um, 
Ms. Layden has uh, requested almost a near um, flatlined budget with the exception of an additional 3,000 in her textbook accounts. And I can jump to the narrative if she'd like to begin uh, reviewing her, her particular line items. Thank you. Um, I wanted to mention a few of the, the current status that happened this year and some highlights because they really do guide the requests for next year. Um, we did uh, put in about a, a little over a thousand new Chromebooks this year, which takes us to over 2000 Chromebooks in the district. So we really did double our Chromebook capacity this year in the, in the schools. Um, that includes classroom carts, library devices, universal access devices, replacing devices that were broken. So um, we're in a, a much better place with Chromebooks. So we have um, on average about one and a half to two and a half students per Chromebook right now. And, and that's um, what we, we had when, the, when we ended our, for our closure. So um, we do have a fair amount of devices that have gone out, but that is what we were at as we um, enter the closure time. We uh, were in the, process of actually replacing old iPad teacher or staff iPads with Chromebooks. So um, we put about 350 of those into, into, um, into play. Um, we have some, some staff who continue to hold on to their iPads, but we have enough to, to replace the ones for people who do want them. They're very old, the iPads from the first buy. Um, a lot of our equipment is from our initial large bond buy, which was in 2012. So we've been trying to replace desktops and Chromebooks and iPads and, um, and, and get into a, a better, more current technology position. Um, we did have the opportunity this year with, the, with resources that became available to start replacing desktop computers. Um, so we replaced... We're starting with the teaching labs that really have a higher demand on the devices. So we did about 125 of those. So we did a new tech teaching lab in the McGlynn and Andrews Middle Schools. We did it in the Roberts and McGlynn Elementary School and the Curtis Tufts Lab. So we did start replacing those desktops from the old 2012 machines. So those are very old. They're about eight years old in play and they're actually probably about nine years old in build. So they're, we're getting up to 10 years on those devices. Um, so we're hoping to, to continue those labs. We did the high school ones already, except for one. So we're, we're starting with the tech teaching labs and then we're moving to the other labs. Um, we do have a new high school maker space, which was almost done and almost ready to be, to be used. Um, and that's funded by both the city of Medford as well as we had a Verizon grant. So those, those materials are coming in, um, that includes things like 3d printers and virtual reality headsets and. 3D pens, and so there's a lot of things that were coming into there. Um, we're hoping to build further down in K-8 to schools, which is why I mentioned that one now. Um, we did expand our computer science offerings, both in the K-8 to tech classrooms as well as the high school. We had a new high school teacher this year for technology, so we're able to offer additional computer science classes, digital literacy, a student help desk. So we're building that program, the new website, the welcoming library um, as part of our library program. Um, we did start after school STEAM workshops at the middle schools. We have a high school relaxation station. Um, we have a partnership with the Medford Public Library that allows students to access the public library services. Um, we started STEAM workshops through a partnership with the public library with the middle schools. They were alternating between the two schools. Um, we did increase the before school hours for the library at the middle schools and both of those library uh, paras are receiving a stipend to do that. Um, and we started an, an enrollment, which became incredibly critical as we started this online learning um, in the Student Data Privacy Alliance. It's a statewide initiative, and it actually makes sure that all the programs that we're using with our students, those vendors have agreed to student data privacy agreements. And so um, we were in the process of onboarding with that. And then um, now with everyone working on lots of things online, that's become really critical. So we'll continue that process um, as the as the year goes on and we'll have an annual enrollment with them. Um, so those are my general ones. The general um, items in the budget, they're, they're pretty standard each year. The kinds of technology we're using are, um, are, are, are pretty standard. The computers and the monitors, the laptops, we're doing a lot of support for those. Um, the iPads we're phasing out in general, except for specific needs. Um, the Raptor security systems, the uh, 
digital cameras, uh, projectors, all, all the basic operating, um, day-to-day operating licenses, software, Microsoft licenses, subscriptions, support. So those are, those are pretty standard. Um, so that we are about the same from year to year um, with, with some changes of what we're supporting, but, but still the same level of support. Uh, we have uh, one technology teacher in each of the K to five schools. We have one technology teacher in each of the middle schools, and we have um, uh, several technology teachers at the high school, some of who share their roles with tech support, um, media support with our media literacy class, our web design class. Um, Allison also does the, the website. Uh, we have, and then one full-time uh, computer teacher who's doing the, the various courses. And so we align with the, the new standards. We're not so new anymore, the 2016. Um, the library staffing, so all our, uh, the Medford Elementary Middle School libraries are staffed and open five days a week. And that was a, a big push in the last few years to expand the staffing to be able to do that. Uh, the paraprofessionals are managing the, the K-5 to libraries and the certified librarians are traveling between. So we have one half-time elementary librarian who is traveling between the elementary schools. Uh, we have one middle school librarian certified who is traveling between the two middle schools. And we have one certified librarian and two paraprofessionals who are covering the high school. So um, we're sharing those resources and we have a library para who keeps those libraries open and maintains the, the collections in each of those libraries. Um, so that's our, our current staffing at the library. Uh, the plan going forward is to replace the remaining uh, desktop computers in the technology teaching labs that we have not yet done. So that's the Columbus, the Brooks, and one um, Medford High School web design tech lab. So replacing those 2012 machines with, with more current machines because the, they're getting really too old to do what we need them to do with those school in the tech labs. Um, we have, um, we've been putting in a lot of Chromebooks, which is a great thing. Um, the, but the oldest of our Chromebooks are beginning to age out in terms of support from Google. So there's an auto expiration of, of supporting those operating systems. And so each year we'll start that process of those becoming too old to update. They'll still be functional but they're not functional in the way that we're gonna allow them to be used for like MCAS testing. So th those will have to start phasing out for, um, for certain use, even though they still may be operational. Uh, the first year that's gonna happen is in, in 2021, there'll be about hundred of them that will age out. In 2022, there'll be um, almost 600 that will age out. So we're gonna hopefully start doing that sooner rather than all at once as they begin to the auto update expiration um, will, will come due each of those years. We're looking to support a makerspace in each of our libraries. Um, we're looking to build technology course pathways at no cost, except perhaps for a stipend. We're looking to bring the Girls Who Code clubs to each of our schools. Uh, they'll be either after school or lunchtime kinds of clubs. And then going forward, we do need to look at replacing the 2012 machines that are left, the desktop machines that are left. And there's close to 1,200 of those. So we're looking at options to either start phasing those through, looking at lease options, looking at buy options, but they're big and they're expensive. It's a, it's a, big, it's a big ticket item. Um, we're looking at cybersecurity training for all staff and single sign-on exploration, which is something that's been on my radar, but it, it sure would have made a whole lot easier the transition now to doing distance learning if there was a single sign-on to all the, the programs that students need. But we are looking at exploring that for, for next year. So. Um, in the budget allocations, the additional salaries, which are not in the, the salary line item, but we're looking to have, um, oh, the, no, sorry, the additional salaries that's listed there are, it includes things like the summer work for our tech support, um, additional technology maintenance for after school, things that we try and do not during the school day. So that, that goes to the additional salaries. The contracted services item, it's pretty much um, similar every year. The help desk reporting system, our library software, our online coursework, Plato, um, the Student Data Privacy Alliance is a membership each year, a, a variety of those kinds of things. The equipment maintenance is pretty self-explanatory. The instructional supplies, keeping anything running requires screen repairs, microphones, DVD drives, lighting, tools, mice, we, that's just a, an annual expense. Um, the replacement equipment is really just trying to replace what gets broken until we can replace it 
in a larger scale kinds of things. Like we've been able to do at least a little bit in the last year. Um, so we did replace, we started, I listed those replacement items we've already done. Um, we're increasing, the only increase of those items that's in that budget now is the $3,000 for the textbook account, and that's to cover increasing the collections, diverse titles, as well as um, the changing social studies and civics curriculum. So we just need a little bit more money to, to build that collection a little bit. The book fair still contribute a lot of money to our um, additions in the libraries, especially the elementary school. Um, the staffing, again, that's not in there, but we could really use to increase our elementary librarian staffing. Um, we're half time among the elementary schools for a certified librarian. It'd be good to at least have that person be one, one full time. Um, we'd like to increase the paraprofessional hours in each of those libraries so that it's not just, um, so if we went from 26 and a half to 30 hours, that could cover a little bit of time. Um, Andrews and McGlynn, we'd like to take out that stipend and actually increase their hours so that they could be scheduled to do before school and a little bit of after school time for study hall. Right now, both middle schools are, are covering the stipend for having them work before school so we can have a before school opening. Um, but in the meantime, the library paraprofessionals are continuing to manage the collections at the libraries. So. That's where we are in the library media technology world. Thank you. Any questions? I have a question. And Member Van de Kloot. Um, given the, uh, can you tell us, Molly, what was the um, number of Chromebooks given out to students uh, so far? During this closure? Yeah. 600, about 650. Um, so given that that many has come out, and we'll take a certain amount of use and abuse. Um, is there, uh, and also just understanding, uh, even with that amount given out, uh, there might really be more need. Um, uh, so um, are, we, are we really okay with the numbers that we've got right now, or is it just very conservative? So going forward for Chromebook yeah. numbers, so you know I don't I don't know the answer to that because I don't know the what what happens with these coming back. Um, so we were getting working on getting closer to closer to having an average of at least a, a, a two student per device ratio in the district, and that was really beginning to work well. Um, it was actually decreasing the need for some of the open lab spaces because there was so much more Chromebook use in the classroom. So mm -hmm. it, it was working in that direction, except for specialized software, which needs to be on, on desktop machines. So we were getting closer and each of the schools were using some of their budgets to buy Chromebooks if they could and the PTO, some were still buying. So we were really getting close. And then we, and we put so many in from our free cash allotment this year. So that was a really good, a good move. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that because if we start to decline in terms of the number that comes back and then the aging of the first rounds coming through, we do still need to, I think, replace each year so that those aging out ones, which we really are going to take out of circulation for things like MCAS, because we just don't know about their being able to be used for that, it, it may become a problem going forward. So the answer is we were getting close, but I don't know in the next year. What, what does one cost just to, about two hundred dollars a piece two hundred okay thank you very much thank you member van de Kloot. I had a question too Ma Longo Kern thanks member Kretz yes thank you for the report Molly I really appreciate it um, I um, I had a question follow up to Paulette's question I wanted to know um, were there any students that wanted a Chromebook um, and they still are, you know, we're still trying to reach out to those families or do we know that information yet? I'm just wondering if anybody knows that. So we've had some response since the last distribution last week. I've been contacted by some teachers who've heard of families who need them. Um, my, we also have had some that have had problems with the Chromebooks that they've received. Mm -hmm. um, that we, it's hard because we're not there to, to troubleshoot any of those, but yeah. you know whether it's actually a problem or it's something that we can fix easily. But so there, there are still numbers. I'm not quite sure if they missed the, the notification about the two or to be honest, do they need to have them brought to them? We really don't know. So there mm -hmm. are definitely still some students 
who have been coming definitely fewer since the last distribution, but we, we did a lot more than the last one than I thought after the first one. So I'm not sure that we're done if we're able to come into the building and do it again. I'm guessing a third round would not be a bad thing to do. And we do at this point have the devices to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I had one more question. Um, and um, I just wanted, um, you know, I know it's detailed in the report, but um, I thought it was interesting. Um, if you could uh, describe the difference between the certified school librarian and the librarian paraprofessional. So the certified librarian is trained as a librarian. And so they are able, they're actually teachers. So they are trained to do the kinds of, um, not just the administrative of checking out books or putting them on the shelf, but actually to, to classify those books and to assist teachers in their in selecting materials for their curriculum. And the library paraprofessionals, although some actually happen to be teachers, the, as, a, as a matter of um, the job description, they're not at all required to be teachers and don't have that training. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor? Yes, Member Graham. Thanks, Molly. Um, can you tell me, the screen that we're looking at now, which one of those line items is the replacement uh, budget? So the the replacement, the 175 is not um, the added replacement. That is replacing what's right in the, the, the dollars for the three labs that we haven't yet done. But then the, anything else, if you look at the wish list, the estimated cost, if we were to do a large scale replacement of 2012 machines, there it's either essentially, you know, close to $1.4 million in a one-time switchover, or it's an annual lease. And I was looking at some of the lease costs and that would still be close to $400,000 a year to do that. And that would be a lease to own um, just because that's what they do. So the 175 would equal the labs at Columbus Brooks and Medford High for 75. Right. Plus, what is the other 100? Oh, plus replacing any, any of the older devices that break that have to be replaced. So any desktop that, that needs to be replaced, projectors that need to be replaced, printers that need to be replaced, broken desktops. Um, the Chromebooks that, that start to be, are now six years old that are starting to be need to be replaced. So it's all the normal maintenance plus all the hardware that needs to be replaced. But it doesn't include the 136 on the second line of the plans. Is that right? The one. So if you see right, um, it says MPS technology refresh plan up under plans. And so th that number says 136. Right. So this, that hundred is not the same as That's this 136. Right. Not in there. That's okay. Right. Um, and then when you talk about uh, things like uh, maker spaces and building learning capacity, um, cybersecurity training, I, there's no cost associated with any of those things well, on your plan. Well, some them, Can you? Well, some of those we don't have, they're, they're really just a plan. So the cybersecurity, for example, we had a few quotes of doing some of that cybersecurity training, but we did not move forward with that yet. And that was between eight and $10,000, but we didn't put it in there yet. Well, there are some things that we actually can do even free. So, so we just didn't decide on what that plan was for that, but it is something that we know we need to do for all of our staff who are on computers. We need to have some, some cybersecurity training. Same thing, same thing with the single sign-on. There could be no cost if we use a program, say, like Clever, but it's still something that's a plan from the technology department side. The Girls Who Code is a free curriculum, so there doesn't necessarily need to be a cost if we can get volunteers to do it. Um, so some of those things do not have a cost. The makerspace, I'm actually hoping to seek some funding for like we did Verizon for the high school. Got it. And then um, as, I, as we scroll down your plan, um, there's, this, there's this mention of, I guess it's in the, down to the wish list, um, about the 1,200 machines, the 2012 desktops, the 1,200 machines. Are these... Are these numbers in the budget somewhere? No. Okay. Um, can the machines even be used anymore? So right now, the, um, the hardest use machines are the technology teaching labs. And those are the ones we're replacing first. 
So the other machines on, and so the Chromebooks have taken the, some of that strain off of trying to quickly update those machines. Can they be used? They are being used. They are not updated to Windows 10 yet. Um, the, 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 the plan is to try and do that if we can. Um, it's certainly gonna stretch the, the ability of these machines, but for sort of going forward, we do need to look at doing that. We've done it with some. Um, so we're hoping to do that with all. It may cause a fair amount of them to not be able to be used because it's a pretty heavy load on those old machines. So some of that replacement money that is in that line item for 175 will have to be used for some of those machines or some of the machines that we're taking out of the old labs that we're replacing with newer machines. So to answer that, yes, for how much longer? I don't know. They're getting really old. And so we, we just need to think about what we want to do for that. It's a big ticket item, so it's not in the budget, but it is something that it, it is not going away and only going to become a, a continued issue because it's a lot of them. It's essentially every teacher machine. It's most uh, every pretty much every library machine and it's every open lab machine in, in all of our schools. So it's a lot, it's a lot. So whether we do them gradually, or we do them all at once, or we do it as a lease or we do it as a buy, it's a very large item, but it's, they're getting old. And so at some point they won't be able to keep running. The fact that they power on won't make them useful. So we're sort of making them work, but it, I don't know how, how much longer. Um, okay, and then um, the li when you talk about increased library staff, is there like an average amount of uh, salary that a, li a licensed librarian or a credentialed librarian we would expect to pay? So they would fall under the teacher's salary schedule. And again, you're looking, if you're getting a, a seasoned um, staff person coming in, you're looking at a $60,000 range. Okay. Uh, the paraprofessionals, in, in order to adjust any hours, that would need to be negotiated because they are part of the collective bargaining agreement for paras. So some of the requests in, in the intent of doing additional expanding of library hours certainly has collective bargaining implications and, and is not something that can just easily be um, provided in, in a budget scenario. So there's other factors. The, the, li the library paraprofessional staff are actually not in the, in the union. They're not okay. in the paraprofessionals union. Okay. So you were referring to the non-unit, not the actual paraprofessionals. The par our par mm -hmm. paraprofessionals are not in the, right, they're non-unit. They're not in the, in the union. Um, just additionally, since you were referring to the um, the large scale purchase, what because we really can't identify a one point two million dollar item within the budget, that is something that we would be looking or recommending for a capital project and or um, a bonding to be done separately outside of the budget. That it's just not something that we can actually absorb in a given year. Uh, but that can be explored in another uh, fashion. And um, Kirstine, in your opinion, if we were to have a line item that dealt with uh, routine maintenance so that we don't find ourselves in a position where we're having to bond and spend millions of dollars in one shot, like what would that number be from your perspective well, that would again, keep us maintained? Right. And I think this is, you know, something that Molly would also weigh in on. But, you know, in this, the terms of the line item for the 175000 that's what we've been trying to gradually increase. If we had a starting platform of new devices in one given year, then it would be much easier to determine what a replacement value would be. You know, 225000 would that be a 20% replacement? I can't quantify that because we have so many devices that are um, being reused and, and, and repurposed right now, and we're not at a full startup platform. But yep. the, the intent and what we have done gradually over the last three years, as you can see, um, has you know infused a little bit, a little bit, a little bit in this particular um, maintenance repair line item, if you will, um, replenishment. But that was the idea to get gradually to a 
sustainable number that could just be funded and take care of all of those units as they came up for renewal. Okay, thanks. And I think the hope is that if, if, that, if the devices were um, newer, that that replacement line could go down and we wouldn't have to have the same kind of infusion of repairs and the, the cost that goes with that and supplies to keep those machines moving. So um, it would take out some of that money if we were actually in a better shape with the, with the technology that was coming in. Thank you. Okay, we have 30 more minutes. Does any, anybody have any more questions? Yeah. This is, this is Paul. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm a little. Um, so the wish list was supposed to be things nobody thinks they're going to get. Everything above the wish list, I thought was going to be in the budget. So am I going to have to sit down, pick the budget, then go in and create my own budget, including the things that were asked for, not including the wish list, to know what the budget's request is? Because I thought we weren't working from some number. So I, I don't know why. Um, you know, the, um, excuse me, um, why the, the two FTEs for PE are not in that budget. And why, why is it that a bunch of this stuff that's on this um, media and library stuff, it's not in the wish list category. Why is it not already baked into the budget? Because I, mean, I, I don't know how much work I'm supposed to do when I get the documents to then create what the real documents are supposed to be. No, Paul, I think what you're looking at is the real document in terms of the request from the department heads, with the exception of staffing. I thought it was important that you see the staffing levels as they are before you begin to add to them, regardless of, okay. a, of a request. So that, the, that, 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 does, that makes perfect sense, but then where and when will we sit down and actually do that add? Is there, I don't see that in the schedule of meetings. So that it's, will be in, in the, the totality the of the budget. Once it's completed and you see where we are and what the reality is to the city's ability to fund and the revenue sources coming in, at that point in time, we will have the, the realization of where um, you know, the total bottom line budget needs to be. But this again, is not what the city council has been clear on. They want us to send them a budget for what we need. We need a librarian at every school. The, the June 1st budget is not going to include that. I, I, would, I would say that we have never gone in that uh, mode of preparing an inflated budget with wish list items. I'm not uh, talking about the wish list items, though. I'm talking about the stuff above the wish list line? Well, in terms of each department and, you know, superintendent can, can also add, add to this conversation is that there are things that are contingent upon collective bargaining agreements, contingent on um, the realities of the budget itself. But in terms of where we are going to be at the end of this process, I think it's, it's going to be valuable that you see where we are without any of those additional staffing and they are requests at this point. I, I mean, I think the media lab one is a little more complicated and I know where we have to keep moving, but you know, the two FTEs for the PE health uh, department, those are, not, those are not nice to have, those are not wish lists. They should be on this budget. And then at the end of the day, if the budget is too big and city council says no, then we go back to the drawing board and figure out what to cut. But as it is now, as I see how we're going to do this, we're going to send them a budget that is the small percentage increase that will include nothing that the departments are asking for. And it's just going to be, I mean, ignoring the current crisis, which is how we're sort of operating at this moment in time. Um, but, you know, just year over year, there's no reason to think that five years from now, we will ever have a P, a, a, um, somebody in the health education who can help our students with disabilities. There will be nobody in there five years from now who will actually teach our middle schoolers what sex is. Um, I mean, this is the repeated process. This is my third budget where we don't ever add any of these people in. Um, and okay. the city council is supposed to be the folks that we send the budget we want, not the budget we think they'll accept. 
Um, if I may, just put, put, just point of information, this budget is higher than I think can actually be presented as it is. Where This is working off a 5% increase where I think the city advised recently we should only be working off of a 3% increase from last year. So maybe if the city council is looking for what additional, on top of the 5% increase, what additional things the school committee is looking for, maybe it should be on a, a side uh, memo or, but I, I just want to, I just want to clarify something we, we had in our meeting about how we're going to run the budgets, that there was no target and That's everybody right. in the room went around and said, there is no target. We're building this from scratch. And now we're talking like there was a target, which I think half of us honestly believe there was always a target. We were never going to say it out loud. So Indeed. there can't be a target of, there can't be a target of 5%. If there's not a target i mean we had this conversation at length and i was personally told that there is no such thing as a number that we work to lots of looks like i don't know what i'm talking about and yet here we are we're talking about a number that we're working toward and we don't even know what that number is no one has ever told us there's a five percent number we're working toward can we start no. a queue? can we start uh, a queue there so that we're raising hands and starting a queue uh, yes, um, Dr. Vincent, then Member McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, so the June 1st meeting, um, that would be reserved for us to do our final review and revisions. The process that we're going through right now is looking at where we are with the additional pieces. So in addition to health, in addition to what's been said for technology, in addition to what we talked about for literacy and um, additional coaches, at the end of this process, even though we don't have a set number, um, whether, whether it ends up being 4.75% or 5% that the city council ends up approving, we do have a number. It's not a solid number. I think there's a little bit of wiggle room, but it's within a reasonable um, wiggle room for this year. In light of what we're going through right now, um, everyone is very aware that um, the entire nation is in a state of crisis, we have to really be realistic. Um, last year, for example, we wanted to get the adaptive PE added. We weren't able to do it last year. And so I definitely was committed to prioritizing adding the additional adaptive PE program for this year because it's something that we deferred a year ago. However, all of, all of those suggested positions, there's no way we can add an additional 50 FDEs by the time we're finished with the entire process. So we don't have an exact number, but we have some type of a ballpark. And um, even though I represent the, the schools, you have to understand that we're part of a larger city. And the same way we're making our requests, the fire department will, the police department will as well. And um, we just need to, uh, I think be a little more flexible this year and understand that um, although we don't have a hard number, we have to have a reasonable number. And when we do have all of those positions by the June 1st meeting, we will be able to say, okay, let's prioritize which ones can we realistically do. And we're gonna say yes to some um, requested positions and for others, they're gonna have to be deferred another year. Um, or longer, depending on what we can manage. So I, I, I think we need to go through this, this process. We have 20 minutes left. We still need to hear from health services and from athletics about what's going on and um, how they are being impacted as well. And I'm hoping um, that I know there may be one or two other questions that we're at least able to um, let those two departments present because we do have, um, it, is, it is a serious situation, but we, we need to let them at least present what it is they're doing, what's realistic, what their wish list is. And then in the end on June 1st, um, that will be our true marathon session. And maybe when we get closer to June 1st, we may want to modify the time and leave a larger block of time for us to be able to really talk about um, 
what needs to stay and um, what needs to be added and what needs to be let go until a future point in time. Member McLaughlin. I wanted to add sort of um, to Jenny, to Member Graham and Member Rousseau's point, I feel like we're creating or we're talking about two simultaneous budgets. We want an actual budget of what a school district, you know, would, especially as a new member, or what the school district would be run at if we had many of the items that have been asked for for some time and have, a, you know, ask for city council. And what I'm hearing is that, and I, again, I'm new to the process. So one, I think it'd be really great to have a process memo um, where we're understanding, you know, okay, this June 1st date, sort of what the expectations are, what we're, you know, the goals are for getting where we're going and that there's this or is not this number that we sort of back this budget into and or this initiative to create what I would call an actual, you know, so this is an actual budget, I guess, of what's actually being spent and what we think a 4% increase will get us. But then, you know, this, proposed budget that people are talking about where we're actually asking um, city council for, you know, things that we, you know, feel necessary, what have you. So that's, a, a, I don't know if it's an additional budget or what, but I think backing it up a little bit, I feel like we need a process memo that's really explaining to us what this process is, number one. And number two, I think that there is an actual versus differential budget. And so I think, you know, you have a line item that's, you know, what we're actually spending, what we'd propose or like to spend, like um, Christine, ha uh, Christine has here, a surplus of deficit. But the proposals, I don't think we can put in a couple of things on this line item and not on that line item and a few here and not there. Like we have to be all or none and figure it out. Um, moving forward. And maybe that's part of the policy or process memo. I don't know. So just putting my two cents in there. Thank you. Um, if there's no other questions for library media, we can move on to health services. I think we have a hard stop time. It, Zoom might cut us off I'm at right at 530. So we can go into the regular meeting, but let's see, let's see if we can get through the health services. Okay, again, just to reiterate, the only area that is not being included is additional staff at this point. I've included the addition, the current staff as, as it is identifying the steps and lane changes. Um, so for the health service department, we have 1,167,804 going into fiscal year 2021. Uh, there is a slight um, increase in each of her line items. And then she also has a decrease for one of the categories. Um, and we can just review based on um, Ms. Ray's uh, narrative document that she has provided. And I will uh, flip to her narrative as well so that we can go through each of her requests. Good evening, everyone. So um, some of the um, the request for the upcoming year, um, we did have, a, a. I am looking for an increase um, in the summer school nursing stipends because we are providing um, more summer school hours and coverage um, over uh, with each increasing year. Um, as well as in the nursing contract, the nurses um, do have um, stipends available if they want to go in during the summer and prepare their offices and um, update care plans and get everything ready for the onset of school. The, um, the other increase was in um, medical supplies and we have a number of um, medical supplies, specifically the uh, what are called AMBU bags that are used in emergency. Um, they are old, the silicone is degrading, and um, we need to be replacing those this year. So that's um, an additional $3,000 in the medical supplies line. Um, as far as wish list items, um, going to the narrative, um, you can read uh, how the um, school nurse role has really increased in complexity over the years and um, we have a lot of, we've assumed a lot of unfunded state mandates into our role everybody can hear me um, we um, in order to keep students healthy ready to learn and able to access their their curriculum i am requesting an increase in nursing positions 
Um, my, my priority is at the um, Curtis Tufts High School as well as the Andrews Middle School. The Curtis Tufts has a nurse assigned two days a week. Um, in the interim, on the off days, nurses are pulled from buildings, including myself, if there is student need. Um, over the past three years, the, um, we have found an increasing student request to see a nurse, and we have been sending more, you know, more nurses on the off days. Um, there is a need for a lot of health, um, health education individually and as groups related to substance use prevention and vaping education, as well as um, helping these students transition to some um, understanding of what is health insurance, um, how, how do you work within a healthcare environment um, for yourself? So there, there's a lot of health ed that um, the nurses provide at that building. The second uh, request for position at the Andrews Middle School, the Andrews Middle School is the only in the district that's staffed by one nurse. And her role um, ha has come has increased over the past years in terms of um, the amount of student visits that she has, the amount of um, parent support that she provides, health education that she provides. And for equity amongst the schools in the other district, I'm seeking a position for the Andrews Middle School. If anybody has any questions, I'd be willing to you know, try to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Ray. Any questions for Ms. Ray? If not, we can go directly to athletics. Oh, Member McLaughlin. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for the report. You're welcome. I'm just, uh, I know that we've been doing the Universal Safety Committee for the past um, two years. And one of the questions that we've had ongoing is about safety equipment for, um, especially for uh, evacuation for students with physical disabilities um, and other needs. Are there any needs in that area that you're looking at at this point? Or is that something specifically you're looking at grants for? Um, we probably use grant funding for that. Um, I, do, I do have, you know, I have the Comprehensive School Health Services grant, and um, hopefully um, monies in that can be used for some technology purchases, and possibly for um, some safety equipment. That's also a, a venture between myself and the special ed department, um, so we work collaboratively and in the past we have shared some of those costs um, but they are very student specific purchases to make sure that we have um, what we need for the students in the buildings so has there been an inventory or such of that uh, or an understanding of the need or n no at this point oh, yeah yes so you know every, every um, school has a um, safety evacuation sled that is it's a universal sled that can be used for any student in the building. Um, for our students that are wheelchair dependent, we do have um, safety evacuation chairs. Um, we, in the last year, we purchased a very uh, new, you know, a new model that um, is is really. Um, uh, it's like you know the gold standard. So over time, I would like to replace the other the others that we have with you know the the better model. It, it provides a much more ease of use. Um, I, I think the restraint system that it has is makes students more comfortable as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, next, we have athletics. Oh, can, can I ask a question real quick? Yep. Member Graham. Um, for the two nursing positions that you're looking for, Tony, what is the sort of uh, starting point for salary for a position like that? The, the same as, as with the teachers. About okay. 50, okay. We, I can't take in a nurse without any experience, you know, um, compared to a, you know, a new teacher can come in just out of college. A new nurse into the schools cannot. Um, they need to have a, a body of experience and maturity that lends them to work in an autonomous situation. You know, we, we don't have doctors here. And um, so they, they have to have that sense of professionalism and 
and experience to, to allow them to work optimally. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And on to athletics. Okay, for oh. the athletics. Hello, everybody. Uh, hi, Bobby. Hello, um, Mr. Lou. I'm just going to briefly um, review and recap for the athletic salaries. There's only one that is funded from the budget itself, and that is the athletic trainer. Uh, the other main salaries, which include Mr. Maloney's and his um, secretary, come from the community schools. Um, again, so that's another piece that um, we, we look at the gap fill at the end of the year. So for the athletic department, the salary is just for the new uh, athletic trainer. Um, this will be her second year in fiscal 2021, which is why you see a reduction. Um, and we have um, a few uh, variations that we were able to um, reduce some line items. And I will let uh, Mr. Maloney jump in and I can um, share the narrative as we go along. Uh, we're pretty good. We're, we should be good. I think if we do have the spring season, we, we'll have no problems. Uh, last year, the school committee was kind enough to implement uh, middle school sports. It's went off very well. Uh, it, it was a projection of 75000 which that's not needed. Uh, I think we'll be fine with these numbers next year. And uh, thank you for all your support and getting me in before 530. Any questions? I can only see Member Graham on the screen. So, okay, Mem Member McLaughlin, Member Graham. Thank you, thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in um, integrated or inclusive sports. And uh, I know that a number of our cities surrounding us have um, that option. Um, sorry, my screen just changed um, with the with the change in the sharing. Um, so can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yep. So um, I know a number of the surrounding communities have that option, and I'm wondering if that's been a consideration for, I know that you guys have worked hard with training in um, a number of areas, but I'm wondering if it's a consideration for any of the sports that we're doing, and uh, especially like the middle school sports, making sure that students with disabilities and, who, you know, some of whom have, extensive needs that we're finding ways to um, integrate them into our sports community. Yes, uh, Rachel and I have had extensive conversations. Uh, thanks for the uh, support on the adaptive PE position. We're hoping once we get that position online that the, uh, the three of us will sit down and uh, uh, make this happen. Okay, and so for the after school, any of the other athletics for the um, students to be able to participate, like the middle school program, those other things, um, are we having to turn away individuals with disabilities at all that want to participate as far as you know, or are no, there any? No, not, not, not to my knowledge. Both principals have been very well, have, have done a great job about, you know, the inclusive, inclusivity and everything. Uh, Nick Tucci and Mike Downs have not said a word to us, neither have the coaches. Okay, thank you. Any other, Member Graham? Um, in our first budget meeting where we um, talked about the budget process and the notion that we weren't building to a number, we also um, had a motion on the table to schedule budget hearings for community schools specifically, as well as the before and after school and food service. So those, those big revolving accounts. And to my knowledge, those haven't been scheduled yet. Um, do we have a plan to get those on the calendar sooner rather than later? And then my second scheduling question um, for Bobby is, we did have a motion to talk about uh, the policies and procedures around athletics eligibility, and that was supposed to be end of March, but obviously um, we're all just a little delayed here. So I was just curious when we could expect that information um, as we go forward. Uh, I don't know if Peter. I don't know if Peter Cushion's on, but I believe the report's done. Uh, Paul DeLeva, myself, Rachel Perry, uh, Mo Laven from Guidance uh, sat down and we put a plan in place. Uh, so I believe the uh, MIA schedule and piece should be done. As far as community schools, I do not know. So just a clarification for you, uh, Jenny. 
those programs are not budget built. They are derived strictly on receipts, reimbursements, tuitions. And so they are, they operate within their own um, isolated program on annual receipts and expenditures out. So what we were doing is just um, reviewing, which I believe I've, I've shared thus far um, in the term of a recap of those program areas, but they are not budget developed. We can give an estimate, uh, but again, right now with the volatility of, of everything that's, that's happening, that estimate is not going to look as um, the normal trend has been for each of those program areas. So in, in the, in the, to the extent of a, a budget hearing or, or build for those outside programs, I, I don't think that that was, that was, that was not the intent um, that I was uh, looking at. Um, well, I think um, it may have been my motion and that was definitely my intent. So um, I understand that they are not budget built in this same way. However, we have no, we have no visibility or transparency into how those um, revolving accounts work like community schools. I know there's a million things that come in and out of community schools and we don't ever talk about those things. So my intention um, when we were having that discussion and I don't know how other people feel about this, but my intention was that we would have a financial review of those revolving accounts that was in more detail than single I a single line item on a single piece of paper. Um, so I'd like to, if that was unclear the first time, I'm happy to um, make a motion right now to um, conduct a financial review of our revolving account programs um, in some level of detail so that we can all understand the ins and outs of those programs. Second. I, I just want to um, jump in and I'm going to ask for Ms. Patterson to give some feedback. Uh, right now, um, I've, I said it last time when we met, um, we are under tremendous pressure not being in a traditional um, working environment along with everyone and um, the demands of being able to prepare the entire budget for the district and now to do an additional deep dive of um, additional revolving accounts. I, I, I feel that that's a tremendous ask and a heavy lift um, where we're already in the month of April and our own fiscal situation isn't even resolved. Um, we haven't had all the departments present for this academic school year. We're still trying to do um, pre-budget meetings and at the same time meeting to deliver services to our students. So I, I, I understand that there was a second, but I, I just feel I need to speak and, and say that this is a tremendous um, additional ask and um, burden to be able to get this done between now and June 1st. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, to, to that extent, not only are we um, developing these reports, doing the steps and lane increases, looking at the contractual obligations for next fiscal, fiscal year, we are also providing and maintaining the level of service within the business center, which incorporates conducting payroll, conducting accounts payable to ensure bills are paid out, we are also having to get started on our open enrollment for all of our benefits that will be started this week. So there's a significant amount of effort and, and work that is going on right now. And if you can see on, on the screen currently, just the, few, the departments that we've reviewed right now, we are almost at $30 million in our fiscal 21 budget request. So as we continue with this process, we're going to have a significant amount of work to do to identify where we are going to come in and be able to present a budget to city council and or in a time frame that will allow us to get that approved before the end of June. So I'm happy to provide a recap again, but as, as I've shared, there are some pieces of the information that are not complete because they are not in the system. So I can't provide you something that is not yet there. I can't provide you um, 
the the amounts that have not been posted. I can't. I can provide guesstimates. I can provide the activity year to date and where it stands. But these programs are in and of themselves supposed to be individual operating um, programs. And if there is not the revenue to support them, then their program is is either supplemented and or uh, reduced in the level of service. So by in the, the capacity of being able to have additional um, meetings in this format, I think is just un, un, unattainable right now. With Mayor. all due respect. Mayor. Member Russo. Thank you. Um, I completely understand that there's only so many hours in the day and there's only so many people in the office. Well, there's nobody in the office. But, um, you know, the, you know, the decisions, for instance, whether or not these programs are offering services or charging fees at a rate that the school committee thinks is appropriate is a school committee decision, but we never get to make the decision. Should we be doing the same cost for families who have a half a million dollars in income versus families that are living on $10,000 a year in income? We don't make that decision. So... You know, there's a lot of decisions that the school committee should be making that are very much related to these these programs. And then also, you know, if the program does that, if the particular account does not have enough funds, we transfer our money from our general budget into it or from another one of those um, accounts. Um, so we're making a decision. There's just so much that we have no idea what's going on. But then at the end of the day, we're expected to just hand some money over or, um, you know, I, I have had emails, numerous emails over the last couple of years, like, why do I pay so little for before or after school from, from some families that are like living large by Medford standards who are like, I can't believe I pay so little. Well, I, as a school committee member, I should be deciding on whether we should be deciding whether or not to adjust the rates for those programs so that we can support families that are living below the poverty level. Um, we don't do any of that. But also, you know, we had that big issue with before and after school, um, or it was really after school um, recently. And that was, um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that, you know, there's this view that after school is collecting all this money, and then we're just using it like it's a piggy bank. Um, and you know, the lack of transparency on the fact that, you know, those employees have benefits and, um, you know, they have all the other stuff that isn't coming out of that account. Um, it, it, we, we need to open the books on this stuff. We need to be able to say, after school brings in this amount of money and after we have paid all of the employees and the city has paid for their benefits for their retirement and all, and I realize some of that will be kind of squishy but right now we don't say anything about it. So if, is it $600,000 in profit we're pulling out of after school people and then complaining because we don't want to pay them more? I mean, that's what it looks like to the public. And that's not an unreasonable view because that's the view I feel like I have often as a school committee member. Um, and I, I get that we don't have enough time to do yet more reports this budget season, but I just feel like this, this, this lack of transparency here is a problem. Well, in, in all due respect, there, there, we've provided that information in each subsequent budget year. So we've identified what the anticipated amount we would need from each of those programs in order to fill the gap. As I reported on the last report of the revolving accounts, we didn't utilize the full amount I was able to reserve. And thank goodness we did going into this um, un, unknown crisis. So in, in the extent of um, identifying that that it's not transparent, I I, I have to um, disagree with that, and I and also identify that there will be more discussion in our executive session that you will have um, the additional information regarding some of those revolving accounts. Thank you. Okay, I, I know we're at five thirty. I I still have a motion on the table. Okay, can you just repeat your motion? It was to conduct a financial review of revolving of our revolving our significant revolving accounts, so food service before and after schools and community schools. 
I'm, to I'm it. super willing. I'm super willing to talk about a reasonable timeline, but I, frankly, I don't know how we ever have a reasonable timeline because every time we talk about the budget, we run out of time. So something has to change in this process going forward for sure. So that we can have time to talk about all of this stuff, but I, we can't, we can't continue to say we don't have time when this committee is expected to sign off on a budget and send it to the city council. And I, whether it's this budget or it's revol revolving accounts, it's all related. None of it is, none of it can be isolated. Um, not the way we currently do business. I agree. Um, we could move this meeting to the 530 meeting if we want to continue the discussion or we can take the vote on the motion and then go to the 530. That Either I just way. wanted to weigh in. Yep, member Van der Um Can we pick one of the areas that we want to see? Um, no. <laughs> no. Well, in, in terms of time by, or, you know, you said June 1st. Can we say June, hold it out a little bit longer? Um, you know. 15th? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're running that. out of daylight. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, um, and uh, by the way, I, I'm certainly willing to, you know, I know. I, I, I know that we wanted to put the budget meetings before the other meetings, and I know that there's a lot of planning time, but, you know, we could consider doing a different night as well, uh, or time. Um, I'm just trying to work out, I, I hear the administration saying, oh my God, you know, we've got so much to do, and I hear your need of saying we need, um, you know, to, to see more in depth. I think we have discussed, and I think we will discuss some of it uh, in, in depth, but um, I'm trying to look for a place that might be a little more amenable to administration. Can we push it out, Kirstine? Um, you know, just for a... Uh, um, I'm doing the best I can. I'm one person here. I'm one person doing the finances. Uh, I'm, I'm doing everything I possibly can to get this budget. The operating budget is the, the main drive here that we are trying to maintain. Um, I still have my own obligations at home as other folks do, but I am, I am one person and one person alone working on this process. So in, in that regard, I, I can't promise a, a, an unrealistic timeline. I'm working 12 hours a day on this stuff right now. And, and quite frankly, it's, it's impeding my vision right now, looking at these screens and we'll be on these white screens for another five hours. So, I am doing my very best for this um, for this process, and it has been transparent. And I have provided the documents and the numbers as they have been provided. I will load up the the numbers for all these additional um, staffing if that's the, if that's the request. Um, but I cannot maintain multiple different budget builds and and now go into deep dives with the other programs that still have not been concluded in the sense of an annual um, operating timeline. So I'm willing to amend my motion to um, give us until October 15th to have these meetings. Um, um, in, to start the budget meetings in October next year? Or no, to I'm talking specifically about these revolving account meetings. Oh. Um, they, can, they can wait to occur until next year, but they, need to occur before October 15th. Uh, I'm not sure that's uh, necessarily real right now. Um, uh, what? Uh, however, um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know what is public and not. I'll second that for the October 15th. I, I think it was already seconded though. Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Member Mayor. McLaughlin. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering also, and uh, I've been in, in Paulette and Paul and uh, Mia and Kathy have been on the committee, obviously, um, for more than one term, but I've been in several meetings in the past where this has been, this information has been asked for. Um, and so I I'm just confused because it's not like, okay, now I know we have a lot of you know, we have a pandemic going on, we have lots of things going on, but this has been asked for in the past and it's always been sort of put off and I'm not really understanding why. And maybe that's just 
I'm out of the loop or maybe somebody can enlighten me here, but I, I don't really understand why this has been asked for for years and has not been answered. Well, it that's not been. accurate. We have provided the revolving account reviews and in, in all uh, fairness and honesty for this, this body that has been done on an annual basis. Usually we are working on that um, for March. However, things have been um, in, in a backlog situation. And quite frankly, a lot of this has to do with things that occur in the treasury office at City Hall that are out of my hands. I cannot report something that is not yet in the system. So in the, in the sense of saying that this information has not been provided, I'm sorry, but that is not correct. We have been providing an annual review of the revolving accounts um, for each of them subsequently. And I can provide those reports for you as they have been done the last three years. Member Van de Kloot, um, hold on one second. I need to, can you unmute yourself? Yep. Thank you. I would concur that I've certainly heard the information before that it's not that this information was withheld. I think it's just the update on the information. And uh, in previous years, we also waited because the um, accounts were not uh, uh, finished off yet uh, to a later date in the in the year. So um, I certainly would endorse what Ms. Patterson is saying. Um, so, you know, we can certainly shoot for October 15th. Um, I think um, if so, we can take the vote and move on now um, that that would be our objective would be would be good. Uh, and we'll, um, you know, all things considered. Sounds good. Um so a motion to review all revolving account, account accounts and have meetings to do that on or before before October 15th. Motion by Member Graham, seconded by Member McLaughlin. All Roll those call vote, please. Yeah. Roll call vote has been requested. Member Vanderkloot. Member Vandeklu, you have to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, yeah. it's not working on land. Roll call. You got to unmute yourself. Hold on. Go ahead. You do it, Member Vandeklu. There it's we go. Only. Thank you. All right. Member Graham? Yes. Member Kretz? Kathy? She might have got Yes. Oh, okay. Um, um, Member McLaughlin? Yes. Member Mastone? Yes. What? She left. Okay. Uh, absent. Oh, she's here. She's, she oh. said yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, member uh, Vanderkloot. Yes. And member uh, Mayor Luongo Kern. Yes. Seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative. Um, paper passes. Yes, from Paul, too. You didn't ask me, Paulette. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Member Rousseau. I, I marked you off, Paul. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there's no other questions. I believe this kicks us off at. 5.45, Mr. Cushing? Okay, 5.45. So we can continue this. Let's take a five-minute break and reconvene at our next meeting. Um, on the other, you have to get, log off and then get on to the next Zoom call. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>